when they can associate how I'm eating with how I feel afterwards, that's absolutely tremendous. Do you think that everybody has a wheat allergy? I'm always a proponent for like, do what works best for your body. And so if you have zero ailments, then maybe you're one of the few that are fine with it. I think the way we produce and spray and grow our wheat is different. Everybody that I talk to that cuts it out, even for 30 days is just like, oh, I feel better. I'm sleeping better. I have more energy. I think it's definitely an interesting experiment. Being a mom is the toughest job there is, and it doesn't come with instructions. So it's okay if you don't have all the answers. We'll figure it out together. This is Mom Brain with Ilaria Baldwin and Daphne Oz. I am Danielle Walker. I am a cookbook author and food blogger and mom of three. And let's see, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I'm trying to think what else. This is always so awkward to talk about yourself. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> say the name of your website. We say oh, say yeah. where people can so find you. I, I run the blog againstallgrain.com, and my cookbooks are all kind of under that umbrella. They're the Against All Grain cookbook series. Okay, cool. Well, so I mean, I'm, as I'm sure you can tell, we just sort of dive right in and jump around just, and talk, talk about, about everything. Um, I and I it. have to tell you, even as someone who has followed you from afar for a long time, been a friend for a couple years now. I feel like we, um, you know, I still am always in awe when you put up, especially, and I think our, you know, I think our audience will be really curious to hear about this, your kids' meals. Like, I am utterly fascinated by the way that you eat and how you take care of yourself through food, but also how you take care of your kids. Like, you'll put up, you know, liver meatballs <laughs> and, <laughs> and you know, know. grain-free <laughs> chicken fingers and all this. I know, but it's amazing. And your kids love it you can tell your kids love it so I I just I don't even know where I want you to start I kind of want you to start with your story and and yeah. and why the elimination of these specific foods has been so helpful to you but then I really would love you to jump into how your whole family has adopted and loves this way of eating well it would, it's not always that perfect but it's not always <laughs> loved I mean it's it, they're, they're they've been raised that way so I think I have that to my advantage rather than trying to like shift you know, eight year olds who are picky over to that way of eating later. But yeah, so I have an autoimmune disease that I was diagnosed with right after my husband and I were married, just like two months after our wedding. Uh, and I spent four or five years in hospitals and on really high debilitating dosages of medications and nothing was really working. Um, and in fact, was actually causing things to feel worse, just like tons of side effects. And I, you know, had to take medical leave for my job and I was spending weeks and weeks in the hospital at a time and, um, just was not thriving in life by any means. Um, and nearly lost my life three or four times. What was the what was the diagnosis? And, and you were twenty two, right? I mean, yeah, you were a kid. twenty two. Yeah, oh it was gosh. ulcerative colitis. It's uh, similar to Crohn's disease. Okay. Um, but essentially, if it goes the flare ups, if they're really severe, like mine were, um, you can just get so anemic. Uh, that's that's kind of where I was. Like my hemoglobin count, which I learned a lot about back then, but it's as a woman is supposed to be somewhere around like 14, 15. And, you know, after childbirth, like a lot of women deal with that and get somewhere like around a 10, which can be just, you can make you feel really tired. And, um, but I was around a seven or eight. Um, wow. and so like half of what I should have been. And so that's, I had to have blood transfusions and, um, I would lose like 25 pounds in two weeks and then have like arthritis in my bones and just, like just a ton of other stuff just from all from mostly from the medications. Uh, and so I checked with all of the specialists in the area. Like we were in the San Francisco area. So we, you know, went and saw a ton of different doctors for second opinions and kept asking them, you know, is there anything dietary wise that can help? And ulcerative colitis and Crohn's are in your digestive tract. So while I'm not a doctor or nutritionist, there was something in my brain at 22 that was like, everything I'm eating is going through the place that is having this disease. So is there something that might be, you know, making it worse or maybe something I'm not getting enough of? I mean, we weren't like, you know, fast food eaters three times a day or anything, but I was eating a standard American diet. I mean, I grew up learning how to cook with white flour and white sugar and pastas and breads, like just, you know, the way most people eat. And so I just, there wasn't anything that was glaringly obvious to me. I was like, I don't know if there's something I'm not getting. Um, but every single doctor said diet doesn't cause it, it can't cure it, and it doesn't help it. Um, and so I just kind of kept suffering for a couple of years and then finally stumbled upon a couple of books and then really some like medical chat boards um, back in the day before Facebook and Instagram were around. 
uh, and just found people like real people who had similar diseases that were using food and that had found remission. Uh, and so once I kind of heard it from someone that actually knew what it was like to experience a disease rather than a doctor who, you know, just saw patients and just knew studies, it was enough for me to say like, okay, I, I think I'm going to try this. And so I right, did. This was also it. kind of before the the web had taken over yeah. as a resource base for people totally. who wanted to figure out how to eat differently than the standard American diet. So you, how did you, I mean, how did you find these people who yeah. could sort of show you the, the yellow brick road that you needed to follow? Well, a lot of it was me and a lot of trial and error, but like the kind of just initial thought of, hey, food could actually play a part was from medical chat boards. There were, you know, I don't even know if they're still around, but there used to be these chat boards before kind of social media where people would get on with and they would, they would be broken up by different diseases or ailments, essentially. And so you could join, you know, the rheumatoid arthritis chat board or you could join like the <laughs> UC chat board. And I'm just going back to my like early forays into AIM and like yeah, instant totally. messenger, you know, 18 hashtag like five foot eight hashtag like green eyes. No, it's exactly <laughs> what it was. And everybody's signature like had what they were diagnosed and what medications they were on and whether or not they'd had the surgery. Surgery. And it was just, for me, it was, I just didn't know anybody in real life who had an autoimmune disease at all, let alone mine, and especially at such a young age. Mm -hmm. And so while it's a little strange to be talking with people you don't know about your ailments and specifically with UC about your bowel movements, um, it was like almost comforting to me because it just felt like there were other people who got and understood what I was and going probably through. probably that there's that there's hope and you have yeah. some sort of, you know, a direction Absolutely. of, you know, like for me, I'm a big planner. So it's like, if there's a problem, I need to find the plan, the path. And we're going to like, even if it's a lot of busy work and in hindsight, you're like, okay, wasn't really on the right trail there. But like, at least I was living for and trying something. Because exactly. just to sit there and be like, throw your hands up and be like, God, well, this is what it's going to be, you know, right. that's, that's, right. uh, that's upsetting. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how I was for a few years. Cause the doctor said that food didn't matter and that the medications, you know, they were like, if you take these, you'll live a normal life. And I just was not living the normal life that I wanted at least. So you found that, that you found that when you were on the medications that your health was it, did it improve or not so much? Not no, really. it didn't, which is so interesting. And so because the regular medications weren't working, they were talking about either removing a portion of my colon yeah. or doing a lifelong immunosuppressant drug that would have been administered through an IV every six weeks. And it sh shuts down your whole immune system. So, you know, I had, I didn't have kids at the time, but they said, if you went on it, you can't go around preschools because you can get like every single bug that goes through a school. Oh or gosh. if you get um, you know, any, like you can get staph infections easily, or if you get tuberculosis, which I was like, you know, kind of random, but, um, that it could be fatal because it's, it just essentially shuts your whole immune system down so that it doesn't keep fighting and overacting like an autoimmune does. So those were kind of my two options at the time. And, and those at such a young age just didn't feel like great options to right. me. Uh, and so food was almost our last resort, which, you know, it's, that to me felt like, okay, well, it's not another med. It's not another thing that could have like, you know, potentially really hard side effects. Let's give it 30 days and try this and see, you know, and then if that doesn't work, then we'll look into surgery or to these, you know, other really, really extreme uh, medications. So the elimination diet, uh, yeah. and you know, you don't have to take us through every step of it, yeah, but, yeah. but basically where did you end up and what is it that you now eliminate and how has that been for you. Yeah. But also, I also just want to say, like, I don't think of you as a I don't think of you as a totally woo woo person. Like you're not against medication. You're not against not medical all. intervention. Yeah. But it's, it's fascinating to me that you found so much more success through the daily medicine of great right. food. Right. And um, and just really curious to see how that's been played out for you over the last 10 years, 10 plus years, yeah, 15 years. Yeah, 10 plus. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm not. I mean, in fact, I say like with the, out the blood transfusions, I would have died. And I also had C-sections with my kids. So I'm like, there is an absolute way to kind of meet. And I think food can play such a huge role in Western medicine and it can make it so much more effective too. Um, and so, yeah, no, I'm not. And I even stayed on a lot of my medications for a while while I was changing my diet just because you know, there's a lot that goes on there and my body was dependent on those things. And, um, so no, I'm not against it by any means, but, uh, I ended up working with kind of like a functional MD. So, um, uh, an MD who is looking more into kind of like the holistic, I guess, I don't really know how to explain it, but looks more internally and tries to figure out the root of the problem rather than just covering it up. with Suppressing it, right? Yeah. yeah. 
And, um, and so, yeah, we ended up cutting out grains and dairy and legumes. So it looked like a paleo diet, which it's so, you know, it's funny because back then that wasn't really a thing. And obviously now it's gotten big. And, um, so it, it was just really more based on, we did food testing and kind of what came back as sensitivities. And then we also just cut stuff and watched to see what my body did. Um, and so it was grains, dairy, legumes, and then we kind of went one step further from paleo and cut out eggs nuts and seeds, and then nightshades, which can be really inflammatory for anybody with autoimmune conditions. So it's like tomatoes, um, eggplant, eggplant, peppers. peppers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And within 48 hours, I saw a decrease in my symptoms by like 75%, wow. um, which oh was... My gosh. Did you do a lot of journaling? Yeah. Like, no. Like, no. Okay, I ate this. this yeah. This is how I felt <laughs> afterwards. My husband told me to keep a food journal probably for like three years while I was struggling <laughs> and trying things. And I just it felt really overwhelming for me as I was dealing with the disease. And then I have from middle school and high school had a history of eating disorders as well. And so journaling everything to me just felt like it could send me down the wrong path, but Mm -hmm. he was right. (laughs) And I finally did start doing it. I realized like, there's no way for me to understand and realize what's causing each thing unless I do start writing it down. And so once I did, it was pretty and it was pretty incredible just to see the correlation between things that I ate. I mean, I could look back a week and see I ate this, this, and this, and the next day felt like this, you know, and then, oh, I ate it again the following week and felt like this the next day. And it was really clear kind of what things were causing issues and, and grains and dairy were probably the two biggest. Was was it hard to Was it hard to kind of come to terms with this at the beginning before you had a diagnosis because of your history with an eating disorder, because this thing is like, oh, okay, okay, I'm not getting, getting really skinny, skinny or maybe it's, you, you know, you start, start to question yeah. your, I mean, I had an eating disorder for like 20 years yeah. and you start, you start to question your sanity with food in general. Totally. And you're like, am I just obsessing about this or wow, I am getting even skinnier. This is kind yeah. of like, you know, this is, this is what I would have hoped for when I was back in that place. Yeah, it's that's something that I don't I haven't actually talked that much about. And it definitely does mess me up because just mentally, you know, um, and I've been well from it for a long time, but those mental feelings don't ever fully leave. And so, yeah, I mean, at the beginning when I would lose such, you know, a crazy amount of weight in such a fast period of time, there were times where I was terribly skinny and I would sometimes still look at photos and be like, oh, you know, I wish I could look like that again. And then I realized though, thankfully how terrible, I mean, I was just, I was in bed for months at a time. And so that now I associate with that. I'm like, yeah, Yeah. I could lose that much weight because of this disease. But then I almost died first of all. And second of all, I was in so much pain all the time and I couldn't take care of that. At that point I had, you know, my oldest son and couldn't take care of him and couldn't work. And so as soon as those feelings do creep in, thankfully they're associated with such trauma and pain that I kind of don't go there anymore. But right. in the beginning it was, um, but that fast of weight loss in such a short time causes so many other issues. I mean, I would wake up in the middle of the night and my heart felt like it was going to like burst through my chest and my joints felt like a 90 year old woman's joints. Like your body can't lose that much that fast, no matter how, you know, no matter if you're like normal weight, underweight or overweight that quick and that much is so drastic for it. And so I think that those little mental reminders are helpful for me, I think, in that. And that weight loss was because your body wasn't absorbing any nutrition from your food. Right. Yeah. So so I guess I because when you say no, no grains, no dairy, no legumes, yeah, like, like no nightshades, which, you know, just a couple, you know, a couple of variety of different vegetables and I guess tomato is technically a fruit. Yeah. I think to most people, those th- those have theoretically been told to us are very nutritious foods. Like, how are we, you know, which is why I'm, I'm always so curious to learn more about, I, I don't purport to be an expert in paleo eating. Like, I'm really fascinated by it because people are so passionate about the way they feel when they subscribe. But but particularly legumes, I'm like, I could not live without beans and, <laughs> and lentils. And th- that's what I go to when I'm trying to limit myself from sugar in particular and grains in particular, which for, for me, me are. are the big, not just trigger foods of like weight gain, but trigger foods of addiction around food and, yeah, and totally like cravings around food. So why no legumes? Yeah. <laughs> why, why are they specific? Why is that? 
that sort of like way? Why is that specifically unhealthy for for people who are eating a paleo way and, and for for you see like you've described? And what do you eat? <laughs> I guess, I guess yeah. Well, question. so to answer the legume question, it's funny because I was eating them for a long time when I first switched to, to grain free. I was still doing legumes and I was soaking them and sprouting them, which I think helps with digestion. Mm-hmm. Um, but they were still causing me a ton of gas, which I think a lot of people feel like when they eat some beans, I think it depends what it is, like maybe lentils or something like that. You know, some people might be able to do, I think there's a lot of people that eat grain free and dairy free, but might still do legumes for me particularly. And I think maybe just because I have a digestive disease, they're just really hard for me to, to process and to digest, yes. um, no matter how they're prepared. And they just cause like immediate bloating and a lot of pain. Um, and from what I understand, and I'm like, again, I'm like, I'm just a recipe creator and the person who has the disease and have to eat this way. So I'm not an expert, but I've been trying to learn more and more from what I understand there's lectins on the outside. And I think that's similar for some of the nightshades, but I think there's something about the outside of the bean that is just difficult for your body to break down. And I guess that's why sprouting it and soaking it helps to remove some of that. And so I think that makes it easier for some people to process and tolerate. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think people even just notice that, like if you're making, you know, a thing of chili and you just throw in like raw beans into it, sometimes it's harder to digest. But if you soak them in a bowl of water overnight, it helps to kind of remove that outside coating a little bit that is hard to break down. Adding a splash of um, apple cider vinegar to that water also really helps. helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 But so many of those traditions, it's so interesting especially if you look at cultures that historically use a lot of lentils or a lot of beans, yeah. like the mothers were always soaking, right. you know, they always right. would start like hummus. You'd start the garbanzo beans a day or two before you'd have lemon right. in the water or apple cider vinegar in the water. You'd, I mean, it, these were just cultural things that we got rid of when we were like, Oh, let's just make can the beans we're and too, make it we're fast. Too busy you know? for that. We're, we're way too busy for that. We don't Still mind edible. like farting for the next five days, <laughs> but like we're too busy to soak. Um, I mean, honestly, that's part of my theory is that that's why people were healthy. Here and, and in other cultures too, like there were the U.S. definitely has, I think, one of the highest prevalence of autoimmune conditions, which are all inflammatory. And I do think we've lost a lot of the traditional ways of preparing foods. I mean, even just down to we don't really ferment anything in our culture either. You know, it's like you look at every other culture, and there's some sort of a fermented food, whether it's sauerkraut or kimchi, or you know what I mean. And so, or uh, there's just or kefir. Like there's a lot okay. of other cultures who eat fermented foods on a daily basis. And in America, I think it has become that quick thing. So we stop sprouting things, even with grains. I think some people can tolerate them better when they're actually prepared, you know, in the way that they used to be, whether they're soaked as well or I don't know. And so I think some of it has to do with that. I think you know, if maybe I was living 40, 50 years ago where we were still preparing things, maybe a little longer than that, but uh, where we were still preparing things in the traditional fashions, it may not be such a problem. So what, so now we know what you don't eat. What do you eat? Yes. Yeah. So I know I try to focus on that. So grass fed and pasture raised animal proteins, so beef and chicken and all seafood, um, vegetables, which I find I actually eat a ton more veggies than I used to back when I was filling my plate with a bunch of, you know, grains and rice and potatoes and things like that. Um, and then fruits and seeds, um, berries. I'm like, what else? Nuts, seeds. Yeah. So wait, but nut- you can eat nuts. I thought we could. Yeah. Eat nuts. So I wasn't for a while during the elimination diet. I cut that stuff out and that's just like a six month thing usually for people, whether it's, it depends who you're doing it with. I mean, I was working with my doctor. We did six months off of some of those things just to kind of let my gut heal. Um, and then now I'm more of on just a standard paleo diet. So, okay, so the one so, I did before was a lot more strict. And it was just like it. elimination, kind of anything that could potentially cause inflammation we cut to see what, oh what was the problem. Oh, just take us through like, I'm sorry we're, we're dwelling on this so long. I just really <laughs> am fascinated. What's, what is, what's a typical day of meals for you? And then we're going to get to the kids because I think a lot of people are really curious about how health focused people feed their children just because there are so many options that are overwhelming and and we know, you know, yeah. set your kids up for just difficulty focusing, difficulty learning, retaining, you know, energy issues, like et cetera. So your daily diet okay. is what? Well, I don't make myself breakfast as often as I should. So usually it's some sort of a smoothie <laughs> um, just to get out the door and then I'll eat something later. 
But um, yeah, so a smoothie usually with either like coconut milk or almond milk or cashew milk. And then sometimes if I have like a dairy free yogurt, I'll throw that in there if I have made it or if I bought one. Um, and then I have a like particular paleo protein powder that I like sometimes to put in. It's either like a collagen based one, or I have another one that, um, is actually like a bone broth based, um, mm. protein powder, but it's chocolate flavored. It's really good. Ooh. Um, and spinach or any sort of greens. And then depending on what I have on hand, but, um, either like flax seeds or chia seeds, something like that thrown in there. Uh, and then lunch, it's usually, well, just as busy and working and mom, I'm usually eating some sort of leftovers from whatever dinner was, um, or a salad, just like a big, huge salad. Or I like to do um, lettuce wraps with like if we had leftover chicken the night before with all sorts of stuff, you know, whatever I can find shoved in there, any veggies that I have and um, tomatoes, I like pickles. Um, so that's usually like lunch. Um, and then dinner is, Usually our, it's kind of like protein, sweet potatoes. Um, I still, my kids still eat some grains, which is what we'll talk about. They do rice is kind of like the one that they can do. And I don't notice any issues. Um, and they do white potatoes. Like my whole family can do white potatoes. So I'll make them roasted potatoes or something like that. But we always all eat the same like protein and veggies. Um, so whether it's fish or it's grilled chicken or they love like um, grass fed flank steak, um, so, but then there's obviously the nights where we do some of the kids stuff, which we can talk about the nuggets that I keep in the freezer, or like grass fed hot dogs or a fallback often. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, so it's just like a lot of veggies. Most, I would say like in terms of our plate, it's like half veggies, um, and then maybe a quarter protein and then some sort of a starch of some sort just to help fill everybody up. Do you snack and do you have dessert? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, I have dessert. And um, that's why I started like writing cookbooks. Cause I was like, I can't live without dessert for the rest of my life. I'm such a sweets girl. So I don't have dessert every day just because the grain free desserts are made usually with like nut flowers. And it just, I find I can't do that all the time or it will give me some gut like distress. And I just think regardless of the type of sugar, like I use natural sugars, I use honey, I use maple syrup, but I still don't think that that's something that I should have three times a day. Mm -hmm. It's kind of just back even to when I ate dessert back in my prior days. It's like, you know, it's still a treat. I'll do it a couple of days a week or whatever if we're celebrating something, but it's not all the time. Um, and yeah, I snack. I don't snack as much as I used to. When I first started eating this way, I found like, I felt like I was hungry all the time. And I think as my body's gotten used to it, it's just been so long. But if I snack, I usually snack on fruit or veggies or like dried fruit and nuts. Um, and think what else I snack on sometimes chips like there's I eat plantain chips or taro chips like stuff like if I want something salty mm -hmm. um and now more than ever there's so much there's like grain-free crackers that you can buy I mean there's like you could pretty much get anything that you used to eat in a grain-free format these days so you do these amazing Instagram stories where you take do you take us shopping at Costco oh, or you take us shopping like wherever, wherever, filling up your pantry with, I mean, it's, it's insane the amount of product we've now, uh, you know, asked yeah, producers to create. What do you, you have three children, nine and under, what do you feed them? Do they eat like you eat because you're nervous they might have similar flare ups or because that's just, it's just easier for you, frankly, to juggle it if you're not making you know, eight different meals for everyone? Yeah. Um, it's a little bit of both. So when I first started eating that way and my, my oldest, who's almost nine, I was still feeding him just the normal stuff. I mean, I was trying to buy like better versions of it, but I was, you know, buying all the crackers and the, the rice cereal. I mean, I was doing everything that most parents do. And I remember going to a conference and just hearing about some other moms who were feeding their kids kind of the same way they were and just that they were focusing more on nutrient dense foods and, and they still bought some of the snacks and stuff here and there, but um, I also, there was a panel on just about how autoimmune disease can be hereditary. Um, and then also how children that were born from cesarean can be more susceptible to that if it already is, you know, genetically predisposed. And my oldest was a C-section baby um, and I hadn't given him probiotics at the time. I just didn't know a lot of what could happen through a C-section. And so it, it, didn't like frighten me, but it did kind of open my eyes to that of like, oh, wow, I'm spending so much time figuring out what's good for my body. And I'm, you know, eating all these foods and not eating these because they supposedly cause inflammation. And so maybe I should try to get him eating the same thing so that I try to set him up for a healthy future. And I mean, thinking about, I told my husband this the other night, just like thinking about my kids being diagnosed with my disease at some point just breaks my heart. 
Um, and I can't imagine them having to deal with everything that I've dealt with as their mom and having to like watch them go through that. So a lot of it is just trying to prevent them from having a disease like that diagnosed later in life. Um, and you know, I mean, we're not like, so I always tell people, I'm like, they eat paleo probably 80% of the time and they're gluten free hundred percent of the time. Um, none of them have been diagnosed with anything. The only thing we've ever noticed is just like a little bit of hyperness and kind of, you know, a little bit of more talking back when they've eaten things with wheat and sugar in them. But I still, as they're, especially as they're younger, like I'll still let them taste things at a party or whatever, and kind of let them try to make the decision for themselves. My oldest stomach definitely hurts if he eats a bunch of junk. And I think it's just because his body's not used to it. Right. Isn't, isn't, uh, that, isn't that interesting? I feed my kids a certain way at home and then, yeah. but I do believe exactly like you're saying, we don't, unless they have a an allergy, we should let them be able to make the decisions for themselves, explore, feel like they fit in. Yeah. But it's interesting having the conversation with them after my kids will tell me my, my two older ones. I, so I have, I have five, I have five, three, two and 10 months old. So the two and the 10 months old are not having these conversations yeah. <laughs> with me, but the other two, they're like, yeah, mommy, I had the ice cream at the party cause they don't eat dairy at home. And like, I don't feel very good right now. Or even at home, they're starting to say, you know what? I'm going to have one more bite of this because I want to enjoy it, but I don't want to get a tummy ache later. Yeah. So they start to associate, which I think is an incredible gift that you're giving them when they can associate how I'm eating with how I feel afterwards. That's just, that's absolutely tremendous. Do you think that everybody has a wheat allergy like it should wheat be something in your opinion should wheat be something that no one should eat ever oh it's such a hard <laughs> I'm always a proponent for like do what works best for your body and so <laughs> if you have zero ailments and you notice zero bloating or you know and you sleep great and you have no joint pain then then maybe you're one of the few that are fine with it um right. I also think again going back to like our country I think the way we produce and spray and grow our wheat is different. Um, and so if, you know, you're over in Europe or something, I, it might be a completely different story. So I do, I mean, I think it causes inflammation and everybody that I talk to that cuts it out, even for 30 days is just like, Oh, I feel better. I'm sleeping better. I have more energy. And so I think it's definitely an interesting experiment for anybody who's dealing with anything. You know, if you're like, I feel amazing and hundred percent all the time, then you're probably fine. But I think but it what's interesting about that. what you're saying is from being a yoga teacher, a lot of people don't realize how crappy they feel until they start feeling better. And they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe or people be like, oh, no, I feel great. Well, sure. When I get out in the, in the morning, I get up in bed, my foot hurts. And now and then, you know, maybe my tummy hurts at this time of day. But, you know, you get so numb to just oh, yeah. feeling the way that we you live feel. with so much underperformance in our own bodies or feeling of lethargy can't focus needing a pick-me-up at four like all these different and, and like you said you know your foot hurts and you don't think that that's because uh, you have a buildup of calcium or whatever it right. might be right. that's because of what you're eating you know it but it's um it, it I, I don't I don't know if it's because we've become because I guess you get accustomed to whatever you're dealing with on a daily basis. But I do think, I, I, you know, the couple times that John and I usually, if I'm not pregnant in January, will do, which hasn't <laughs> been that frequent, um, will do, like uh, you know, a, a pretty stringent um, uh, low carbohydrate style elimination type of thing in January. And it's really, I mean, it's just during the weekdays. On the weekends, we kind of eat whatever we want and celebrate with family and enjoy ourselves. But during the weekdays, we, um, you know, we cut out dairy, we cut out gluten, we cut out sugar. Um, the first week it usually involves a way more, you know, restrictive thing. And then you add back week to week. So the first week you aren't having any legumes either. And you're, I mean, it's mostly just vegetables and fruits the first week, which yeah. is impossibly difficult. It's so, so hard. But you, what you do realize, and the reason he especially sticks with it kind of throughout the year for the, for the five days of the week as much as possible. And like, you know, you make, you make flexible choices because you're at work and you, you yeah. know, sometimes you run into problems that way, especially he does. Cause he's not, uh, maybe I'm not as good at helping him prepare for going to the office. But, um, but you, the, the, the miracle of being able to see in your own body, even if you think you're functioning perfectly and you feel perfect, of the, the at the end of the five days, how great you feel, and at the end of the weekend, how absolutely Terrible. crap you feel. Yeah, yeah it's fascinating. It is. Um, 
Wait, let's talk liver meatballs. I'm sorry. Okay. These are like the most interesting thing to me imaginable. Um, I know. What, you have you you have put up so many cookbooks and they're all bestsellers. People go absolutely nuts for Danielle's recipes because they they really are you know for dealing with all the restrictions that you've put on them. They they you 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 pour your heart and soul into developing them and you really test the test test them over and over and over again and people are thrilled with the results. Um, and in your last cookbook, you had a whole section which I'm now blanking on the name of, but you you can tell us. You had a whole section about stuff that you store in the freezer, especially for the kids, and liver meatballs. I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what I know, is this? I know. Liver, is that, I mean, talk about the whole thing. What is oh this? Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, so I first will say, there's like the paleo camp that is like 100% all about eating like our ancestors did, like, you know, nose to tail and all the different parts. And I just have not been able to get on board with all of that over the years because it just totally grosses me out. But I kept hearing about just the benefits of liver and obviously the iron and then just all of the different vitamins that were in it. And, you know, with especially with little kids, how their iron stores start to go down and not a lot of kids aren't eating like bowls of leafy greens and, you know, things like that. And so for I was trying to incorporate it into my own diet, but then also thinking like, probably be good for my kids to get a little bit of this. And so I made these pesto chicken meatballs for a long time. And I thought, well, what if I just hit a little bit in the meatballs for them? And they love them. Um, and it makes me feel good just knowing that they're getting some of that extra stuff in there. Uh, and me too. Like, so I keep them in the freezer all the time. Um, I tell people, I'm like, it's a, it's a strong flavor. And it's kind of amazing that like our grandmothers and great grandmothers used to just sit down to like a plate of liver, liver and onions. onions and liver. Oh. I'm like, I don't think I could ever, ever do it. I mean, the smell of cooking it alone is enough to turn me off of it, but I feel like it's one of those things that I'm like, just a little bit, I want to get it into their diet. So I kind of hide it. Um, there's a, there's a breakfast sausage recipe that has and then the meatballs and those are really the only two times, but they like, I keep dozens of those in the freezer at all times. Cause it's just such a quick, easy protein that I can pull out and they love it. Like dipped in marinara. Do they, know, do they know what they're eating? Not yet, because there's not. I don't think they're old enough. I mean, maybe if I told my eight year old now, he might be like, "I'm eating what?" But um, the little kids don't have any. Last yet. night, last night I was cooking with my daughter. I cook for them um, every single night, and I'm trying to. I got we we had a very interesting guest on here that talked about how many times you have to offer a food before your kid will actually eat it. Because my my second child is so picky, it's like makes you want to cry. And so I went back after talking. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go back because basically what I started doing was like, all right, I'm sick of going to the store and making these like very complex meals or things that I'm like put my heart and soul into it and then they want it he wants to eat tofu and oatmeal every single night you know what I mean at least it's like not the worst things in the world but like when you're eating the same thing over and over again I worry you know at least I'll drink like green smoothies so like we're we're okay but it could be so much better so I was like all right roll my sleeves up I'm gonna go back to into it and so my daughter wanted to cook with me last night um, and I was getting nervous because I hide so many things in their foods yeah. and I was like okay but then you're you're entering the circle of trust of secrecy <laughs> Now that you know what's in it, you can't, because I know that you like it, like you it. can't <laughs> say that you don't like it mm -hmm. anymore. Because she started the beginning, she's like, you put avocado and broccoli in my smoothie? And I was like, I do, and you like it, and you've had it for a very long time, okay? <laughs> but it is interesting how, like, all of a sudden you put it in their head, and they're like, oh, no, 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 I, No, that. they do. And she milked it. Carmen milked it. Um, Hilary <laughs> FaceTimed me at, like, 7.30 last night, and I was trying desperately to get Philomena to sleep, and <laughs> Philomena was like, what time? What time do you go to bed, Carmen? Obviously, immediately, Philomena was like, Carmen, what time is your bedtime? Oh, my God. Tell me yeah. now. Tell me <laughs> now. <laughs> and it's usually much earlier than that. But she's literally like saying, she's like, every single piece of kale that she's roasted, she's like eating it. She's like, Mommy, this is just so good. And I'm like, you just want to stay yeah, up yeah, late. You're just buying time. <laughs> yeah. But, but you're if you're like, well, eating if you're kale while you're doing it. I, know. Exactly. I, I, I will, like, I will okay. pay that price in kale. Yeah. But, but I don't, but, but, le but liver is theoretically a detox organ. Like, do you worry about toxins in it? Or how do you buy it so that – because, I mean, I love chicken liver toast. I haven't had it in a while because it's one of the things that you're theoretically not supposed to eat when you're pregnant because like a filter, like, you know, mollusks and things that, you know, filter stuff on the bottom of the sea, you theoretically don't want to eat the organ that is filtering it for the entire body in an animal. Okay, um, so how do so you buy? I have an article. I'll have to. I'm not. I'm like. I'm not going to even try. Oh, send it to me. I'm read, such a nerd. For yeah, this because stuff I, I actually read a lot of that too, and I was worried about it. And then, so I did some research on it. And from what I read, and I we do try to buy organic and pasture raised chicken livers. Um, but 
there was something I read and I, I will send it to you. I'm not going to even try, but it made me feel comfortable and feel like, oh, okay. And then I just, I'm like, I go back to the way that our great grandmothers used to eat and how healthy everybody was. And I'm like, they ate that stuff all the time and they ate full fat, you know, dairy and they ate, I don't know, they ate bone or they, you know, made bone broth from scratch. And so I'm like, if they were doing it and they were living until they were 100 and having no autoimmune disease, and I'm like, they were mm-hmm. obviously doing something right. Can we talk about how to eat? So, I, you know, I love, I'm always interested in listening to what people eat, what people don't eat. But are you, are you somebody who is super conscientious of how much to eat, what, your bo- what signals your body is telling you? Like, I know through my own, you know, path through figuring out what I eat, what I don't eat, when I eat, you know, how much. I really have to listen to eating when I'm hungry, stopping when I'm full. What does that feel like? I mean, can you, can you talk to us a little bit, if you have, if you have thoughts on it, talk, talk to us a, a little bit about that because um, I'm sure, you know, uh, people are going to love the recipes, but if you can shed a little bit of wisdom on your gut and on your digestion, because I think a lot of people have problems with digestion because they're also just not eating at the right times when their body is ready to accept the food. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't know that I have too many thoughts on it or that I'm like super mindful about it. Um, I definitely do. I mean, I eat when I'm hungry and I stop when I'm, when I'm full and kind of try to teach my kids that as well. Um, we're not like a, you have to clean your entire plate type of a family. And like, as long as you tried everything and you say you're full and you're not going to ask for a snack in like 30 minutes, then, <laughs> then you're good. Um, but I mean, yeah, I eat, I don't do any of the like, I don't do any of the intermittent fasting or anything like that. I mean, I eat when I wake up if I'm hungry and I eat, you know, lunch when I'm hungry, but I definitely don't skip meals. Um, I try to make sure that I'm eating, you know, three meals a day and more than anything, just because I don't make good decisions. If I'm like so hungry and I haven't eaten anything and then I'm like, I just want everything that I can find and I'll just take bites of things here and there and finish my kid's plate or, you know, it's just like, I don't eat. I don't feel like I eat as well unless I plan and kind of like make sure that I sit down and have a meal. But um, yeah, I don't know that I, I wouldn't say that like in all honesty that I think about that as much. (laughs) It sounds like, I mean, but with that answer, it sounds like you, it sounds like you do. Okay. I mean, mean, there are people, especially like all moms who are listening to this. How many, how many of you guys go and like finish your your kids plate of food? Cause you don't want to waste it. I do. Or or just eat standing up like little, little shifts that I've made. I mean, my background in food, I should just say my life in food is like more is more, my life period. More is more. I, I'm like, I love to celebrate with it. I love to enjoy it. I I never want to have to deprive myself of things. And I'm and I'm lucky that I don't um, I don't have to theoretically. But what I will say is when I've changed very small but very specific habits to your point, you know, not feeling obligated to finish the food off my kids' plates or not even obligated, like not letting myself be so hungry that that is what I want to eat because because it's there and it's ready. Um, not eating standing up, really trying to limit snacks or at least making my snacks very thoughtful. Um, those simple tacks have actually changed my ability to enjoy my meals so much more. And, to, you know, I eat, we sometimes go on like these European tangents on this show, but I am to your point about the way that our ancestors have eaten and the way that in many parts of the world they still eat where food is a um, it's a ritual and meals uh, it's food is not just sustenance it is a it is a chance to decompress it is a chance to, to connect it is something that you owe yourself um, you know that 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 20 minute pause of sitting and mindfully enjoying a meal um, I think actually you know I, there I'm sure there are scientific studies on the difference in the way that your body accepts those new nu- the same nutrients coming in whether you're eating them you you know, standing up, running in between the subway, whatever, or sitting and letting your brain tell you when you're full, letting your brain uh, acknowledge that you're doing something good for yourself, all of these things. So I think I, I want to change tax really quickly. And you are so um, open about your own story and the way that that has allowed you to become an, you know, you say you're not an expert, but you are an expert. You live this day in and day out and you share with your, with your, um, you know, with everyone on Instagram and on your blog about the ways that you make this work for you and your family. You've, you've also been very open about the way that you and your family have dealt with grief and with loss and with love and all the things that that families go through, but you've, you know, you've done it in a very public way. I, I, you know, just to 
just to recap for people who might not be familiar with you, will you tell everyone a little bit about Isla and a little bit about why why you do share your life in this way and how it's helped you to be able to do that? Yeah, I mean, so our um, so my oldest is Asher and he's almost nine. And when he was three and a half, I was pregnant with our daughter, um, Let's see, yeah, three and a half. And we found out at about 25 weeks that she had a condition that would potentially not make her c- compatible with life, you know, is the words that they use when she was born. Um, and they just, they couldn't know for sure until she was born um, and, you know, run some tests, but that was very likely, like a, a very high percentage. Um and at the time, I had already put out my first cookbook. So I had, you know, had a online platform. And we actually announced that I was pregnant with her and that I'd be putting out my second cookbook right at the same time. Um, we, like, put out a photo of, like, my next book next to my belly. Uh, and so we kind of had, you know, this community, while it's not nearly as large as it is now, walking through that with us and having excitement for us to have, you know, our second child and to have it be a girl and so when we got the diagnosis um, and kind of just got that news, we we struggled back and forth with like, do we let people in on this or do we just kind of wait until she's born and then, you know, fill people in? And there were, you know, kind of two things. One is I just was like, I don't think I can still continue to do what I do and be out in the public eye, you know, in a sense, um, and not let people know this. It just felt like a huge burden that I'd be carrying, that they would be having all of this excitement for me and asking, you know, to see my belly or see the nursery or the things that people do, right? It's like, you know, they get excited and they want to see your bump shots and they want to know how your pregnancy is going. And I just didn't think I could handle it if people were asking all of those happy questions when we were kind of going through the pregnancy with this, like, I mean, it was a, it was a hard time not knowing and it was, you know, we loved her and were excited to be carrying her, but there was just this very real chance that she wouldn't make it. And so I just like, I don't think I can put on a fake smile and talk about my pregnancy and not tell people. So that was kind of, you know, one of the reasons. The other reason was just because we had started sharing my health story and had started seeing so many people being helped by it. And hearing just, I mean, gosh, I mean, at that time, just like already, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that were finding health through my way of eating and that were connecting with me because, you know, they knew similar suffering through disease. And so we had just already seen how much sharing what you've gone through can help other people and how it doesn't fix the problem, but it almost doesn't make it, you know, like you're not suffering in vain because you're helping all of these people afterwards. And so it was also kind of a conscious decision of like, well, if we share and we're able to help another, you know, family who's walking through something similar or who has walked through something similar, then it makes it worth opening up and sharing and being vulnerable. Um, and so that was kind of the decision process of, of deciding to share. And so we didn't, you know, I mean, I wasn't blogging daily through the rest of my pregnancy or anything like that about, you know, what was happening or my emotions or feelings, but I shared a little bit. We, we shared kind of an announcement and it really wasn't, I didn't really start sharing more about her and our loss and grieving until after she had passed. And so she um, lived for about 40 minutes after birth. And so then kind of after that is really when I started sharing just as we were processing the grief and then also with having you know, then a a four-year-old at the time who was also processing grief in his own way and um, just really starting to see from kind of the first time we shared just this massive community that gathered around us and people that were kind of, you know, whether they had been following me for years and just never shared that they had gone through loss um, or people, new people that were coming that were just really looking for somebody that they could feel like they could connect with. And I think the most powerful thing for me was, you know, and I had experienced a loss before my oldest son, uh, we had a twin pregnancy that ended around 10 weeks. Um, but it, you know, I moved, I was, I grieved that and I was, I definitely, I, didn't, I talked about it here and there, but I just didn't realize until after we lost Ayla, just how, first of all, how many women, you know, go through miscarriage and infant loss and pregnancy loss, um, but how silent people are about it. Um, and, you know, just even in our own community, we realized it's a very, 
not t- well, taboo, I guess, but also just really uncomfortable. People just don't, they don't know how to ask you about it. They don't know how to talk to you about it. They're afraid that if they bring it up, then they're going to put you in a place where you're, you know, upset or sad. And so they just kind of choose to just not say anything. That translates to the mom and to, you know, husband as well, but as that they don't care or that they mm-hmm. forgot. Um, mm-hmm. And so the one thing that we heard just over and over and over again after sharing was just how moms just want to have other people in addition to their themselves acknowledge that there was a life that was lost and a life that they already imagined through, you know, wedding. Like as soon as you see that stick, it's like you, whether or not, you know, it's a girl or boy, like you've already imagined them going to kindergarten and you've imagined their first date and they're probably like, it's just, you know, you just, that's what you do as a mom. You start to imagine what that life will look like. And so you didn't get to actually experience it, but you almost grieve the memories that you kind of made up in your head. And so um, we just started seeing just so many people coming and just saying like, you know, I feel like I haven't been able to grieve because the people around me, you know, don't want to go there with me. And I can't ever say my child's name because it makes people feel uncomfortable or, you know, I'll never forget there was a mom who was Gosh, I mean, she was in her 60s and she said, like, I lost a baby boy 40 years ago and I have four kids and they don't even know his name because I've never been able to talk about him. And so, you know, thank you for sharing so openly because now I feel like I can finally grieve the son I lost. Um, So that kind of stuff is just really powerful and kind of made me feel like it was worth sharing and continuing to share about her and our process as we went and um, you know, it's, it's been a journey for us. So every time we kind of go through something new, I, depending on, you know, if it feels right, I share a little bit about it and kind of what our feelings are. And, um, yeah, but it's, so she would be five in June. So it's, we're five years out and I've had two now since, um, which is also something I share a little bit about just kind of what it feels like to go through pregnancy afterwards and, um, how hard that can be for parents and, just to let other women know that it's okay. You know, I mean, I was like a disaster with Easton who came after Ayla. I was just so worried all the time that something was going to happen. And I even had a lot of a really hard time connecting with him when I was pregnant because I, it wasn't her. Um, and I just wanted her there. And, you know, once he came, it was a completely different story, but I've shared openly about that too. Cause I think we just put so much guilt on ourselves for everything, whether you feel or you don't feel enough or, you know, it's just like women can just get down on emotions. Period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's why, I think that's why sharing is, is so important and you've done such, such a service, you know, not just with the food, but, but, you know, sharing um, about your losses as well. And, and then your growing family since, because this is, as you said, it's something that so many of us suffer in silence I mean, I, you know, many people know this last week I had a miscarriage and um, so many people told me not to say anything. People who love me and and they oh, don't do that. I mean, then they know the reality of my life that they're afraid that there's going to be cameras outside of my house, which there were for a few times. And then I just Instagram for people to go away and they actually <laughs> did. Which was like, I mean, at least brought a smile to my face in some That's sort of sense nice. of power, <laughs> in such a powerless situation. Yeah. But, but I mean, exactly what you're saying um, is that so many people came forward and, and people who, who had lost babies like decades ago and said, I've never spoken about this. And now I'm going to speak about it because because you're doing, and I'm the same way. Like if, you know, if Daphne or one of my other girlfriends, they do something, I mean, if it's something silly, you know, like I'm trying this like new nail polish or doing this, I'm like, I want to do that too. But it can also be when these bigger things in life, it can feel so liberating because you're like, oh, it actually is okay. You know, and, and, you know, having babies as, you know, where we've all come here to this podcast to talk about is the the hardest and most magical and most special journey of our lives. And if we're supposed to do like such a big part of it when it's not so beautiful, when we're supposed to do that in silence and just suffer and sort of put a smile and and, and now that we're all on Instagram and other social media that we're supposed to like, let, let me show you my life, but not that part. <clears throat> yeah, you exactly, know? exactly. It gets to be very, I mean, you've, you've done a, you've given a, a really big gift. It just feels people. so real like in a funny way and we've talked about this before too and and the same the same one you shared Alaria like it it was the quote-unquote starting with reality shows and then the quote-unquote reality of social media and all it's all so orchestrated realizing it's, all, it's so far it's from real so because far it's from actually real. scripted it's <laughs> scripted reality or it's you know content <laughs> calendared reads. reality <laughs> and it felt I remember 
reading you know reading your story i remember you know and obviously you know Alari and i had spoken b- before and during and after and since and it's it it just feels like such a part of why i think women especially and not to not our our you know sensitive new age guy cal in the room <laughs> not to discount what men experience too but i think women gravitate towards that so much that sense that someone is sharing something so real with me and so it is personal but it's ultimately extremely um to your point it's it's a service it's like you you we this is real life this is my real life yes i'm sharing a lot of it with you but this is like this is what's going on in the background um i think it was can you give me advice so i definitely want to have another one especially i don't want to i don't want to end on that note of my yeah. you know of my i mean i already have four kids but and that's what people say to me as well they're like well you have other kids and i'm like yeah yes, yes but all, each, each one, one of them, them is important <laughs> you know right. what i mean like if all of a sudden like leo weren't around that would be horrible 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 like yes i have four kids and i love them all equally and trust me if you have one kid i love all my kids as if i were to have one kid so you know what i mean like you you the the heart is this magical magical organ that has the ability to do that what advice would you give to me because i am afraid you know because it was so hard and even though i do believe that it's part of the journey and once you allow yourself to to step into parenthood you say okay i'm gonna do this you have to be willing to get your heart broken many times in many different ways sometimes they hurt more than others but what what kind of um advice would you give to people who have had a loss and and uh want to do it again oh goodness well first of all people try to say things and they're <laughs> I feel like they're well-meaning but gosh we got so many of those types of comments afterwards after she passed like oh well at least you know you can have kids or when are you going to try again and i think um because of that, I put pressure on myself, like, oh, I'll be fine once I just have another one. So I think I would say, I think my biggest piece of advice was not only wait for your body to heal, of course, but I think you do need to make sure that you're mentally and emotionally ready to be there for a pregnancy. Because now, of course, my Easton, like he's almost four and he's just such a joy. And we, he was right for us at the right time, but I regret not being present in that pregnancy. And it makes me sad to think that I wasted, you know, the time that he was in utero of not loving and connecting with him right away. And a lot of it was because I think I thought like, oh, if I just get pregnant again, like we got pregnant almost six months after she died. And obviously, you know, I believe timing, I I believe God's timing is right. And everything happens for a reason. And so he's here and we love him. But if I could go back, I would wait a little longer until I was just a little bit more healed. And not yeah. that it ever gets you know better fully healed by any means, but I was just still so grief stricken when I found out we were pregnant with him. And I just, I thought it would fix things and it didn't, you know, I, like I remember I was even going to counseling afterwards and I quit counseling as soon as I got that positive test. Cause I was like, I'm going to be fine. Um, and it ended up actually, i I went through a whole other like wave of grief after that, that I think I finally allowed myself to feel some emotions. So I think that like, just work on, on your emotional state, you know, and be ready for that. But also then like, I actually wrote an article for the Today Show about carrying a baby after loss. And I think no matter how you lose the baby, you know, I mean, I found myself, I think you're also really exposed after that to learning about all these different ways that you could lose a child, which I felt like I was so naive to before. And so I learned, or I wrote an article just about choosing to have faith over fear. Um, And it was a daily decision I had to make every morning that I got up because every day that I got up, I thought, you know, I don't feel him kick, he's gone. Or, you know, there were, I mean, constant times of going to the doctor and like going to get the stress test because I was like, he's, you know, like something happened. And so I just had to like consciously say, I'm just going to choose to have faith that he's going to live. I love that faith over fear. That's a, yeah. That's a good one. And that, so that's the other thing. Like, it's a hard, it's a hard journey, you know, and it's, it is not easy. Um, but you're also so, so grateful when they come into the world and they're healthy and alive and um, you get to just celebrate that as well. But yeah, I think the faith over fear thing is, is huge. Um, and it's a daily conscious decision. That's so wise. One of my closest friends, um, Maria Jacobs, she, um, she said to me at one point during one of my pregnancies, cause I was talking about, you know, connecting and like nervous and, you know, I had three boys in a row and they were all so fast. And I had four babies in four and a half years. And it was like, okay, well, how, it's just like this whole like mosh of boys. And, it, and she said, you just haven't met him yet. 
you know, that idea. And, and that really was was what it was. As soon as soon as that baby comes out, at least for me, I mean, everybody connects differently. And, of course, we've talked on the podcast before about postpartum and, and sort of difficulty connecting with your child. But for me, as soon as that baby comes out, there is this connection, soulmates for life. And that I, it's interesting that in utero experience where you're never closer to another person. Yeah. When they're inside of you. And then... But then it's like, well, who is this person? And then they come out and then you meet them. And it's like, for me, it's like immediate connection. And it, it really yes. is. It is really is very magical. Yeah, it's the same for me. I know oh. it's different for everybody. but Tell everyone where to follow you or to learn more. Danielle Walker on Instagram. And then everywhere else, it's Against All Grain um, on Facebook and Twitter. And the blog is againstallgrain.com. Yeah, my newest book, Eat What You Love, just came out in December. And it's all about... Eating the comfort food and the family favorite foods that you like, but um, still grain-free and dairy-free and allergy-friendly. 